Well, I haven't said a word and I got a standing ovation. Thank you very much for that. Good afternoon. Oh, come on. Good afternoon. I, my mother would be so proud that I finally made it to the stage of the Atlanta Symphony. You know, she was a, she was a musician and she'd be so proud. Well, I'm glad to be here with you and, uh, and so grateful for, for, this, uh, for this occasion. Uh, glad to be here with you who are social entrepreneurs uh, for these uh, two hopeful days, two hopeful days of the year. And here with you because you are committed to gaining insights, inspiration, clarity, and confirmation toward your purposes that will enrich your local communities. And of course, if we do that, we know we're enriching the world, right? So this is the kind of stuff that makes the world better. And I'd like to say also congratulations to the design team. Can we give them another round of applause? Are y'all watching the news? What a bold stake to put in the ground to say, given the milieu, whether you're on the right or the left, that the future is good. Isn't that bold? Isn't that wonderful? I think it's a bold and de defiant statement. Do you agree? Very good. And so I know we're not in church, but can I get an amen? amen. All right. But we have to do some critical work here just for a little while. We have to ask ourselves, number one, why? Why is the future good? By the way, I'm going old school here, just with some words, no flashy graphics, but stay plugged in with me. Well, why is the future good? I'm glad you asked. Let's start with the big picture, can we? On a cosmic level, despite all the pain, the evil, and degradation that's real in the world, like many people, perhaps like you, I believe that the universe is ultimately tilted toward good. And that is what Dr. King meant when he said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That said another way, anything and everything that is not made of love is made of inferior building material and therefore isn't essentially durable enough to make it into the distant future. That's what we mean by hope. And so if you and I are committed to a good future for ourselves and for the world, we have the cosmic assurance today that we are in concert, in congruence with the universe. That ought to encourage somebody today. But even with the cosmic assurance that the future is good, we know that a good future needs friends. Though the universe is tilted toward good, there are innumerable, innumerable obstacles and speed bumps on the way to good. You don't have to say amen there, but I know you know what I'm talking about. Though you and I have decided to partner with the universe and with one another for good, we know that a good future does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. You could say that the universe is engineered from its inception, from its creation, for co-creation. That's where you and I come in. To a great extent, a good future is earned by harnessing all the nows you and I have been blessed to receive. You already know that, but it bears repeating. Wasn't it Stevie Wonder who reminded us that love is in need of love today? Don't delay. Send yours in right away. That's what he meant. A good future is sped up when you and I co-create a million good nows. That's the work in front of us. How do we do that? We do that by claiming and reclaiming our purpose at every important intersection of life and of business. That's why it's important to say that the future is good given our national milieu. We're reclaiming our purpose, that the future is good at this intersection. There is such a great diversity of entrepreneurial gifts and such wonderful difference in this room. And yet... However we express that marvelous fire, our purpose is nevertheless the same. We are working together for a good future. We are friends of a good future for ourselves and for the world. The goodness of our future, we intend, is the direct consequence, we know, of the goodness of our nows. There is no future that's going to happen without the goodness of our nows right now. And so the future is good, but she needs friends. Since I'm a clergy person, you have to allow me just one Bible reference. Is that okay? 
Jesus often talked with his friends about the work ethic necessary to bend time towards good. And he would, if you read like I read, he would often throw a little shade even at his friends. I remember one story where he wished out loud that the children of light would work as hard for their purposes as the children of darkness were working for theirs. Right? So let me say then, in a non-partisan manner, and this has always been true no matter the political administration, if you're displeased with the direction of your community, of our state, of our country, then let that dissatisfaction serve as your calling and as your fuel. Let's get to work. Let's imagine, let's innovate, let's create across silos. Let's identify and grow ally networks. We know that trees come from seeds, and excellence comes from research, development, and persistence. Business models are refined and perfected from attempts, failures, and learnings. And incidentally, there is no cavalry coming over the ridge to rescue us from this present now. We are the cavalry. The power lies within us. One more thing. An adjustment of how we understand the future might also help. When people talk about the future, they often talk about what? Vision. They talk about what's on the horizon, what's emerging. They talk about seeing around corners. They even talk about intuition. All of those concepts are good, appropriate, and have their merit. But I want to invite you and advocate for an understanding of the future that comes from a deep understanding of now. How well do you understand now, the now of your industry, the now of your offering? How will we precisely know best the good to accomplish for the future unless we understand with depth and clarity, this present now, with all of its blessings and with all of its blemishes. The signs of what tomorrow will be and can be are all around us today. What's the kids saying? What are the kids saying now? Stay woke. We're paying attention. We're paying attention for the reason that we want to participate with the universe, with the divine, with one another to create, co-create the good that is necessary to impact positively the human race. By the way, it's not a human race. Where the hell are we racing to? It's a family, incidentally, the human family. Let me say two additional things here. First, I want you to think about being entrepreneurs who are always running experiments. Where are the gaps in service? Where are the redundancies? What are the opportunities now that flow logically? We ought to be running experiments always as we attempt to serve people and grow our business. But let those attempts, those experiments, not be sort of finger in the wind things. You know, sometimes we can do that. And say, oh, I'm doing good, it'll work out. No. I think we've got to do data-driven experiments. We've got to let the, the data help us, form us, shape us as we intend to do good. Second, and I was doing some of this myself today, find a group of smart people and reflect with them at regular intervals. And they may or may not be people that are a part of the industry that you're in or the offering that you're in. But find some people in different silos and for no other reason than to have a warm beverage today together and to talk about what's emerging, get together with them. Get together with them and, and, and like my Boston Terrier does, sniff the subtle fragrances, fragrances of the wind. Figure out together what's emerging and how to participate. I call that, if you're looking for a, a title, I call that balcony time. Action and reflection have to be balanced if you and I are going to be effective. Action and reflection have to be balanced if you and I are going to be effective. And not only that, if we're going to keep away from us burnout. A lot of good people falling by the wayside for no other reason than they're burned out. They have the right heart, they have the right idea, but they didn't sustain themselves with action and reflection. I'm sorry, I'm getting to preaching right now. In these groups, this balcony time, get together now and leave your ego in the car, all right? 
Because these groups are not about you being right or the most accomplished. You just have to be curious in these groups. You just have to be a deep listener in these groups. I commend these two practices because they will increase our capacity to adapt and to be able partners with a good future. Now let me move on to the second question that I want to address, and that's how can we make the future gooder? Y'all let me say that gooder here. How can we make the future gooder? Well, there is so much to be said, but let me say this. The future is good when we respect the dignity of every human being. That, that's got to be the North Star for us. I am talking about uniform worth and inherent value here. As you and I take up business enterprises and nonprofit endeavors, let us agree, if not ever before, then today, let us agree to make this our regularly realized and shared core value. And let the good that we do be the good of fostering equity, enlarging capacity, and promoting understanding. Let those be our core tenets as we deliver whatever we're called to deliver. We will find that that will give us a competitive advantage. I want you to remember that good is not the absence of evil. It is the response to it. In all of our intentions, all of our work, let us be busy about addressing how we celebrate and promote and heal the human family. What makes the future good? Maybe a mindset reset. Are you ready for that? Maybe a mindset reset. I see some people writing. If you're going to write, write down these next four points. These are helpful. Some folks would have us believe that all real and serious and meaningful life, good life, is organized around scarcity, certainty, perfection, and privatization. Think about it. But I reject those ideas as the coordinates to a good future, especially a good future for the majority of people. I suggest an upgrade. Those ideas which will create an amalgam, a creative, wonderful amalgam are for us going forward that make good abundance, mystery, fallibility, and the common good. I'll do that one more time for you. Abundance, mystery, fallibility, and the common good. It's at least my sense that these are more reliable, more helpful, more healthful, and yes, even more profitable coordinates to a good future. Let me give you some explanations here. By abundance, I mean the understanding and sense of the universe that there is enough. There's enough. There's enough, and we don't have to ratchet ourselves up around this false notion of scarcity. For instance, there is, in fact, actually plenty of food for the world. What we have, however, is a distribution problem. Maybe, if you'll let me say this, what we really have is a generosity problem. But that's for another talk. What we know is generosity based on an abiding sense of abundance, whether we're talking about parenting or marriage or running our business, we know that that sense of abundance is generative, is generative. And abundance can become a part of our institutional cultures. Generosity-based abundance lived out with our clients and customers could even give us that competitive advantage in the, market, in the marketplace. When I speak of mystery as being a part of a good future, I mean mystery as being open to the unknown. Some of us are so sure we are right that we don't see the opportunity right in front of our face. Acceptance of mystery as an open door means we are more open 
to alternative narratives and futures than the ones that have been assigned to us and the ones we have accepted. Being open to mystery leaves us, and don't you want some of this? It leaves us less cornered, less captured, but makes us more fluid and more human. A good future is one where imagination and creativity are nurtured not only for their possible profitableness, but because human beings are made for mystery. It's a part of our ability to be alive. That is why art and music are so important. For example, it is what happens on the way to the notes and in between the notes and on the way to the brush strokes and in between the brush strokes that is so valuable for all of us. Then there is fallibility. Enlightened people, and I'm guessing this is a group of enlightened people, know that perfection is a destructive Cruel joke. Anybody? And that fallibility is actually a more accurate and more permanent state of being. <laughs> but a good future understands that fallibility is not the enemy of excellence. In fact, fallibility leads to an excellence that the world actually needs. I know I need more of it. Fallibility allows us to see what is actually present. So fallibility can move us into deep acceptance of ourselves and of others. There's an authenticity there. Anyone who hates their own fallibility cannot really love or appreciate other fallible human beings. I give you that one for free today. Fallibility helps us understand failure as simply a part of the learning process. So having the capacity to embrace, process, and learn from fallibility is simply understanding what it means to be a human being. An understanding that can lead to wonderfully creative opportunities to serve people. Finally, we come to the notion of the common good. This idea flies in the face of the religious devotion we have in America for the idea of competition. We say competition will fix health care. We say that competition will fix wage inequity. Winning the nuclear arms race will remove the threat of nuclear war. As Jay-Z said on his most recent album, okay. <laughs> Explain that to somebody later. We were taught, or at least I was taught, that competition is the cure for every ill. But competition has not delivered us to the paradise it promised. Only work towards sharing resources with those formerly engineered out of the winner, winner's circle can achieve more common good. We've got to raise the floor height, folks, for all of us. What we know is if we don't take aggressive action in places like Georgia toward the common good, whole generations of children will be left behind again in areas like health, and computer literacy will not be ready for the future, and it will leave all Georgians diminished. We are, in fact, inextricably linked, whether we like it or not. There is no gated community that has a wall high enough. We are together, whether we like it or not. Understanding the common good is understanding that we care for those on the margins, not because we are good, I'm not good, how about you, or that we're altruistic, but because our society and we will never be what we say we are, if we continue to allow unnecessary and extraordinary suffering to live beside extraordinary entitlement. This is what I believe, and I know I'm not the only one. When we are about the work of good, now and in the future, we are somehow more of who we are and who we were created to be. Working for good creates in us not only our better selves, but our deeper selves, and our holier selves, and our most joyful selves. With all that I have said, and that was a lot, let me end my time this way. Quoting the man that Dr. King tried to be like. His name is Howard Thurman. And Howard Thurman said this. 
He said that in, in each of us, there is an ocean. And at the center of that ocean, there is an island. And at the center of that island, there is an altar. And standing guard over that altar, there is an angel with a flaming sword. He says this, nothing gets on that altar without the inner authority of your consent. Nothing makes it on that altar without you saying yes to it, consciously or unconsciously. Friends, you are here because you said yes. You agree that the future is good. My hope and prayer for us all is that we purge from our altars, the altars of our hearts, all that contradict that. My hope and prayer for all of us is that we say more yeses to the things and people who will partner with us to make the future good. I believe with all my heart the future is good. Thank you for the honor of speaking with you. God bless you.